Okay, in this part of the video, I want to talk about users and, um, user and group administration, administrating users and groups. Uh, this is a major task for Unix systems administrators or for Windows systems administrators. There's, um, um, and it's an important task because the security of your system is really based on um, user authentication. And, um, and this is the heart of unit user uh, authentication. Um, okay. We'll go over here to start. And um, the book, let's see, just a moment here. Um, the book talks about this. I will talk about it a little bit differently. But the one thing the book talks about is it talks about the importance of the shadowed file, or of the password file and the shadow file. Let's take a little look at the password file. That's kept under slash etc slash password. This file is the um, administration file for your users. And we see in this file, every user is listed. And if you type man space password um, and with the minus a, man space minus a space password, uh, P-A-S-S-W-D, it will, one of the password, one of the options you'll get will let you, will give you a full description of this file. However, the first, um, Let's go down and look towards the bottom of the file where it's got some actual users. Um, the first guy over here is your username. The next field is an X. That's where the password is kept in, in an encrypted format in old style systems. However, there are major security issues with that. So almost everybody today keeps their passwords in a separate file, which is called shadow. It's also kept under slash etc. Um, the next guy over is the person's UID number, which I've discussed earlier and I'm about to discuss again. The next one over is his default GID number or group number. The next uh, field over is a comment field, usually just the user's name. Maybe the user's name followed by his address, or the user's name followed by his telephone number, or something like that. The next guy over after that is the user's login area. This is where his home directory exists. It's usually just under slash home. On large systems, that's not really good. So I mean, they, they've got too many users to do that. So that may, it may be under slash home slash A, and then all the users that begin with an A, and slash home slash B, all the users that begin with a B. Um, on a few Unix systems, instead of using slash home, for some reason, they use slash U. Um, you know, uh, if you notice root, it's a uh, our home directory is just slash root. It doesn't have it under slash home because slash home may not be on the root uh, file system. And then the last guy over is the um, his login shell. And that's the shell that he gets as a login shell. Notice some of these guys have login shells of uh, no login or a login shell of false. If you have one of those login shells, effectively you can't log into the system. We'll come back to that later. Um, OK. Um, let's talk a little bit about UID numbers. UID numbers on and GID numbers are really important on a system. And it's my contention that it's really important to keep these coordinated across your entire network, if at all possible. Sometimes it's not possible because you don't control all the systems. Or maybe you merge two companies and people come in with different conflicting UID numbers. And uh, you know it's not always possible. But if at all possible, keep the UID numbers uh, consistent across all the machines. So if you give a person a UID number of 
um, 44345 on one machine, you save that number for them on every machine in the network, whether they're installed on that machine or not. That is their number uh, network wide. Why? Well, um, suppose they attach one of these drives, a removable drive like this, to their system. And they write a lot of data on it. And it's got a, you know, an EXT4 uh, um, file system on it. The security, all the security rights on those files on this system are not kept track of by the user's u a username. They're kept track of. They're linked to the user's UID. So that means that if suddenly somebody borrows this disk drive and it moves across the network to a new machine that has different UID numbers, uh, suddenly um, a different person could end up with full access rights to that person's data. That wouldn't be good. Likewise, if you mount drives using a system called NFS, Network File Service, across a drive, the way it's usually done is all the security is based on your UID numbers. And so when you mount across the network, like kind of like mapping across a net, uh, ma mapping a drive across the network in um, in Windows, you mount a drive across the network, the security access will get really goofed up if your UID numbers aren't all the same. There are ways of handling that. There are mapping systems that say yeah, that that will allow you to handle that. Um, but they're messy, and it's a lot cleaner if you don't have to use those. If you do have to use those, they are there. OK. The other place where security, of course, is kept is in the GUI, or I'm sorry, GID numbers, the group access numbers. Now, the um, and the accompanying file for that is just called group, like this. And this is where all the group access information is kept. Right here, this is the name of the group. It's nobody. This is a password associated with the group that we normally don't use. This is the group GID. And after that is a list of all the users that can use that group that aren't the default group. Um, don't worry about this too much unless you're really into this. At some point, you'll learn more about this. But uh, um, so, and likewise with the group number, it goes across the network. Now, group numbers are kind of complicated in the sense that um, some systems, usually Debian-based systems, tend to, every time they make a user, they make a new group by, um, uh, by the same name as the user. So if they make a group D, or if they make a user demandle, they make a group demandle. If they make a user sue, they make a group sue. And and they basically keep track of all the of uh, both the the UID and the group ID very closely. I think those are basically tend to be tighter systems that do do that. Uh, that's one option, and some distributions use that as their default option. Other distributions like SUSE, I think Fedora, but I, I don't remember, uh, use a system where they give everybody a UID number when they log on. That's that's important. But they're, they basically just drop everybody into a group call, um, called users or something like that. or a couple different groups. Um, I've got systems where most everybody goes into one of about three or four groups, users, GIS, um, and I forget what the others are. But, uh, but, but basically, that's the system. Um, both systems work. They are for different purposes. Uh, on scientific and systems that are not so super secure, I rather like the system where everybody goes into the same group. On tighter systems, I suspect it's much better to have everybody, like, say, a banking system. It's probably much better if everybody has their own group. 
Um, um, so, uh, okay. Now, to add a user, there is a command to add a user, or you can add a user using the graphical user interface. Each distribution has a graphical user interface that lets you add users. And they are, let's see, this one is, uh, we're in Yacht 2 under security and users. It says add user. There's user and group stuff. And if I want to add a user, I just simply type the add command and answer the questions. Let's see, user's full name. Uh, user name, it may recommend one, or maybe I choose one. TTT. Um, -t -t. Uh, password. Well, I'm supposed to choose the super type password, but I'll I won't. I'll choose TTT, TTT. Um, there's some other options here. And basically, at that point, I could type um, OK, and it would install my user. Uh, that wouldn't be what I'd want because of just what I said here. Oh, your password's not very good. Uh, well, that's OK. Over in the second tab, you get a chance to define your UID number. And I guess what I'm saying is I would always define that manually myself. Most of the distributions just give the user's default, um, uh, default numbers. And I don't think that's terribly good because it makes it it really gets you goofed up from one uh, from one computer to another. It's great if you've got one Linux computer, but uh, or one Unix computer, but um, if you've got a whole network, you want to do it manually. Okay, uh, we'll cancel this, and we're going to cancel the whole thing. Um, the other way of doing this is to do it with the user add command. And the user add command, there must be a man page on it. And it is, you know, it's a foot long. But basically, what you would want to do with the user add command is I can add a user by typing in something like this. Um, user add space m minus m minus m says make the user's home directory area. Otherwise, it doesn't create the directory for the user to log on on this home area. Um, the minus c is the comment that says put in the user's name. Uh, minus g is the user's group ID number. And I think um, 100 on my system is the group users. UID is the person's is the UID number that I chose for the person. And minus D, um, this directory here is his home directory. And the last one is his username, or the username I chose for him. Um, I find that those options are usually sufficient for me when I add users. And I like to add users using the user, uh, using the command line script. and then I will write a little shell script that will add my users. Because often when I add users, I'll have some place between 30 and 50 users to add at a time. Um, when I taught at a different college, at the end of, uh, beginning of every term, I had to add all my users to various Linux systems. And that was usually 20 to 50 students. And I would do this by just simply writing a little shell script like this. Unfortunately, passwords are really tough to set manually, so or really hard to set from a program. You can do it using a programming language called um, Expect or maybe Perl. But generally, it's hard to set passwords. So I would generally, for 30 or 50 users, I'd just do that manually myself after writing a script that added all the users into the system. So, um, And that's the way I did things. Um, that pretty well is, finishes our video here. And um, I'll come back and discuss a little more about this. Um, but that, yeah, I've got a few other items to discuss. But that, 